using blockchain to create smart contracts with RHEL and Chromia from ChromaWay. So my name is Jürgen Modine. I'm the Chief Solutions Architect at ChromaWay. And my job is basically to assist customers and entrepreneurs with um, finding solutions with blockchain for their ideas and problems or just brainstorm about things they could do with the blockchain. We also have another couple of Chromaway people here today. So we have uh, Michael Konyakovsky, who architects the share registry and blockchain project technical side of that, which we're doing together with LegalWorks. And we have Tobias Rådeskog, who develops the backend for that. So they are both RHEL and Chromia developers. And we have our social media manager, Anastasia Sodina, over there. So lots of Chromaway people here today. So first, what is a blockchain? Uh, since you're interested in the topic, you probably know. But one way of looking at it is that it's Digital signatures. Now, digital signatures were invented by the British intelligence services in the 1970s. Something called asymmetric encryption. And some academics, Rivers, Shamir and Adelson, came up with the same idea two or three years later. And they still form uh, the initials of RSA, which is one of the most popular digital signature algorithms out there. So that's not new. That's been around since the 1970s. Digital signatures have been around since the 1970s. What is new is with the blockchain that there's exactly one context for your digital signature. It's on the blockchain. That's the new thing. You cannot back down from a signature. You cannot promise conflicting things to different people. You can't sell your house to five people because you can see on the blockchain that it would already be sale underway of your house. So a very simple view of blockchain are, blockchains are is that it's a digital signature plus exactly one context where that signature can be found. And you cannot back from a signature and that signature can then be part of a calculation of other things on the blockchain. So Chromia by Chromaway, we're from Chromaway. It's our public blockchain ecosystem. It's high capacity, much higher capacity than Bitcoin or Ethereum. And we also have a powerful language called RHEL, which we believe is a lot safer and a lot faster to code in than in competing uh, blockchains, such, such as, for example, Ethereum. So Chromia is made up of a relational blockchain. So our blockchains run. Yep. Sorry. Yes. I think that's a good point. No, thank you very much. I just need to be able to read my notes. Yeah. So that's a good point. Exactly. Uh, so uh, Chromia is built on Postgres SQL, the relational database of heart. And that means that we actually have uh, the data, the state of the blockchain is expressed in that relational database, which means we can integrate that with business applications. Because all enterprises in the world basically run on relational databases. Um, our system also runs on the Java Virtual Machine. It's written in Kotlin. Um, we use this safe and powerful programming language called RHEL, and every DAP, every application you write, gets its own blockchain. And that's how we deal with capacity. So every distributed application gets its own blockchain, which is then checkpointed into a, a main blockchain in Chromia. And then that in its turn is checkpointed into a proof of work blockchain, such as Bitcoin or Ethereum. We'll see how, for how long Ethereum is proof of work, but still it isn't at this point in time. Smart contracts I was supposed to talk about today. What are smart contracts. What's smart with it? Well, I think you can see it basically on three levels, what smart contracts can be. And I'm going to show you some code for the third and most advanced level later today. So smart contracts can be notarized workflows. They basically 
just tell you what, what signature must come after the next signature. They can be about oracles and reputation collecting signatures in order to make it likely that something is true, or they can align incentives. They can be more advanced, trying to make different uses coordinate their work through the smart contract. And I'm going to show you examples of these. So notarized workflows, the Swedish land registry project. Uh, I was a technical project lead for that project. And we used a smart contract technology called Splix, which runs client side. And it's basically a business workflow. So you agree at the outset what the contract should be. For example, first the um, seller says, I want to sell the house at the price, the buyer bids, the seller accepts, accepts, the buyer commits to the bid, and then you start involving the banks and, and saying, okay, if you have agreed on this, uh, have you agreed on the sales documents, then the buyer's bank may say, okay, I, I, will, I will front the payment that will be mortgage, which is between me and the buyer, between the buyer's bank and the buyer in a separate contract, they front the money and when that is seen, then the, the, seller, the seller's bank feels that it can release what's in Sweden called pant, brev, um, which probably even goes before that. So the buyer's bank says, we'll, re we'll front the money if we're sure we get the um, mortgage um, securities, mortgage, yeah. It's a special system in Sweden where each mortgage is prioritized uh, how much security and how good security they have in a piece of property. And the good thing with this is that all evidence is available in the contract. So if there would be a dispute, you can go to the blockchain and you can see the workflow, the signatures, the different documents that have been signed, and you can agree on uh, that things have, have gone well. Uh, so the court can see all the evidence. It also means because the evidence is apparent, you can also, uh, it's probably going to be less likely that it goes to court because people can see what the situation, what the evidence is. So that's a kind of smart contract that's quite stable and predictable. In the Splix case, what's stored on the blockchain is the agreement of what contract to use, the hash of the contract to use, and then the messages that drives the contract forward. So the actual smart contract in this case is a state machine running on the client machines, on the mobile phones and computers and laptops of the participants. So it's a very stable and mature solution. It's unlikely to go haywire. It won't take down the blockchain, it's impossible. So that's one level of smart contract, a notarized workflow. The next level, oracles. It means, oracle in, in blockchain parlance means something that um, we trust. So for example, if uh, you and I would enter a bet on the temperature outside tomorrow, we would probably ask uh, the weather station at uh, Observatory London up here, Stockholm A as it's called, and we just trust that. And you won't say, no, you manipulated that. You, you were up there yesterday with a low torch, or today, I mean, with a low torch to change the temperature. But oracles are always difficult because they can be manipulated. They are something we trust, but that's how our society works. We have a judge, for example, in court, and we, we trust him or her. Um, so one project we're involved in, which we have done the infrastructure for, is the Green Assets Wallet, which is run by St Stockholm Green Digital Finance <laughs> and a number of other part partners, which you can, you, can, you can see here. That's about green bonds. Green bonds is the idea of having an investment vehicle that you know will have a green impact. And they tend to be limited to Northern Europe, where they also were invented. They were invented by a Danish banker, I believe. But what they want to do is to make it possible to invest with a green impact in larger parts of the world. And in order for that to happen, you need to have trust. So what the Green Assets Wallet does is it collects evidence, satellite photos, signatures. Um, it could be Internet of Things, devices, measure things that also should sign directly inside themselves with the manufacturer's key that this, an observation is true. 
So in that, this way, you can compute a certain level of confidence. Either you can just tell the investor, we believe this to be, to be um, uh, a good green investment with a good environmental impact, or uh, the investor, him or herself, could drill down and look at the signatures and make up their own mind. So that's the next level of smart contracts, where you're basically trying to uh, compute trust. And having all the signatures in one place, you can then make something likely to be true. Um, so it's third-party verification, satellites, sensors, people. Uh, the framework for evaluation is not made by blockchain people. Uh, it's made by one of the participants in the project who have expertise in this field. So this becomes an infrastructure for green bonds. Now for the next and most advanced level, aligned incentives, DAOs. How many people have heard of DAO? You've heard the word? In this case, we're not talking about, yeah, Michael, you heard it, I know. And you heard it, right. So it means Distributed Autonomous Organization. It used to be called DAC, Distributed Autonomous Company. And the idea is that you create a smart contract, contract that is so smart that it can coordinate people to work towards a common goal. The most famous or the most infamous of this is the DAO, which used to run on the Ethereum blockchain a couple of years ago. And there was a programming error in it, so it lost money. And so many people had invested into it that the Ethereum people actually stopped their blockchain, reversed it a couple of weeks or months, and started over from that point in time. That should be a big no-no for working with the blockchain. Uh, but they had to do this because there was a programming error, they felt. Some people did not agree to this, so they actually continued on the blockchain as it were, and that blockchain is called Ethereum Classic, if you ever heard that. That's the reason why there are two Ethereum today. So some people said, no, this is immutable. If some people were fools and put money into a smart contract, a DAO that didn't work, that's their problem. And the notary function of the blockchain shouldn't be affected by that. So, so Basically, distributed autonomous organizations can be a bit pie in the sky. They can have stability problems, <clears throat> as, as witnessed in Ethereum. But you can work in the logic on a smaller scale. Typically, for smart contracts on this level, you need escrow. Escrow basically means that you put some money into the contract, so it's in control. So autonomous contracts typically need escrow. So it has something to decide over and incentivize people with, so that the contract itself can decide, okay, I'm going to release this, because uh, that person has obviously performed something. So there has, has to be some money in it. And escrow is good for dealing with stuff outside of the blockchain. If you think of the Bitcoin blockchain, it never has to do with anything outside of itself. But if you do property transfers, the house is obviously not on the blockchain. It's obviously physical. So when you want to buy and sell things that are outside of the blockchain, or deal with anything of value outside of the blockchain, typically you need to put deposits, you need to put an escrow into the smart contract. For example, if you want to deal with bicycles, selling and buying of bicycles. So the escrow becomes a proxy for the value of the bicycle. So what is escrow? Well, a common way of doing escrow in the crypto world is three-party escrow, and you don't need a DAO for that. What it basically is that you have a buyer and a seller. So if, if Tobias wants to sell a bicycle to me, then you are the independent witness. You're the oracle to this, and I don't get the bicycle. And then I have to convince you, hey, I didn't get the bicycle. And uh, she will rule one way or another. So there is still a need for lawyers, basically. But if we want to be a little more DAO-y, a bit more autonomous, what can we do? Well, what about the two-party escrow? So let's say that the seller and buyer puts money, put money into a smart contract. And this money can be destroyed, or as we say here in Stockholm, vaskat, for those who have been to Stilreplan. 
Nobody. Okay. Uh, it needs no third party, but it can be cheap because we have just taken away the arbiter. We don't have to pay somebody to rule. But it can be a bit stressful. I think basically we need to pay less lawyers for this system, but we might need to pay more psychologists. <laughs> so, how could we do that? Well, let's say that the buyer wants to buy a bicycle. Uh, I don't trust Tobias there. I I've hardly known him 10 years, and, uh, well, actually, I do trust Tobias, but we assume now why I don't trust him. So we both put money into an escrow on the blockchain, right? And if I don't get the bicycle, I'm going to destroy, I'm going to burn that money, including my own money, because I'm so angry with him because I didn't get the bicycle, right? So how would we structure this? Well, let's say on the blockchain, the buyer, that's me, I create an escrow object. And I put in the price of the bike, I'm willing to pay 10,000 Swedish crowns. I put in my escrow of 3,000 Swedish crowns, or whatever. I define the seller's escrow, I define Tobias escrow as 15,000 crowns. And now we either resolve or burn it. So if I get, the bicycle, then I tell the smart contract, resolve this, and Tobias' escrow is sent back to him, my escrow is sent back to me, and the price of the bike is sent to Tobias. But if I don't get the bike, then I tell the contract to burn itself, and then I get my 10,000 back first before we burn it, then I lose 3,000, but I don't mind, because I know that Tobias is losing 15,000. And I think he should be probably punished for not giving me a bicycle. Now, I don't know if any live systems working like this, and I think it's kind of stressful, uh, but it could work like this. And I'm gonna show you how to code this now. So that's maybe too small for you guys. Should I make it a bit bigger? Okay, let's go into burnable escrow. Well, source name, right, because here. So let's see what we have here. This entire contract now is about 88 lines, but some of those lines are empty, some of those lines are me actually creating a bank, which I wouldn't normally need to do for this, because we already would have tokens on the blockchain. So in about 60 lines of code, I've created a smart contract in RHEL that allows you to buy bikes or anything, hopefully. So I'll just walk you through how that works. And uh, I guess many of you, you are not programmers, you don't have a programming background, but I think this is simple enough because this is actually right in between code and law, right? So even if you're into law, this is some of the things you need to deal with in the future. So it's very simple things. I'll walk you through slowly and just let me know if something doesn't make sense. Okay. So first I said I need a bank. Normally I wouldn't need this because I would have a token system in, in the blockchain, but just for this demo, I need a bank. So these 10 lines here define a bank. So we create a class of objects called accounts, bank accounts. And in blockchain, when you're dealing with blockchains, every, every person who signs something has a public key and a private key. And the public key is what he or she is known by in the system. And the private key is secret, which they use to sign things with. So that signature connects the private key, the public key, to the signature. So all you need to know is, if you're in the system, you have a public key, which is like a public face, and you have a private key, which is the secret one, to prove that it is your public key. Okay? Yes. Yep. So we have an account, and since the public key is your public face, we say that each bank account has a key, which is the public key. Everybody gets a bank account. Uh, I put in a name, uh, so you know 
not, not only known by your public key, but a name. And then there is a balance. And in this case, these are set when you create the bank account. You can't change your name or your identity later. Mutable here means that the balance can vary on the bank account. And in this case, we actually start with 20,000 crowns. Uh, I was going to say that this is unrealistic, but given the monetary policies we have in the world today, I'm not sure this is unrealistic. Uh, but in this case, 20,000 crowns is put into to the balance so we can buy and sell some bikes. Then in order to create the account, I send in uh, my public key and my name. We require that the person who sent in this request had signed it with their private key. That's what this means, is signer. And that is true, we create an account with the user's public key as pub key and his name there. So this is very simple. Just, I needed to have some kind of bank. So this is a bank, a very simple one. That kind of works. Now we go to the rest of the um, contract, the actual thing. So we have something called escrow status here. That is basically what state can the escrow be in? Well, it can be active, which means we are actually working uh, on this. We are agreed on something, but we're not ready yet. Maybe I haven't got the bicycle yet. Resolved means that it worked. Um, everybody got their money back. The, the, the seller got paid. Burn mean that, no, the seller was not happy. The money is now inaccessible. It's gone. And uh, I'm bitter as a buyer, but I'm a little bit happy that the seller lost money too. Okay, look at the actual escrow then. First, it needs to have some kind of ID just so we find it again. Who is the buyer? Who is the seller? <coughs> we can have some text about what the escrow is about. What's the price? How, uh, how much money has the buyer put into the escrow? How much money should the seller put into the escrow? How much money has the seller put into the escrow? And are we uh, active or resolved or burned? That's it. Now, the lines that start with operation means that we can send messages to them over the internet. So in RHEL, if you type operation, it means that, hey, this is something you can interact with. So bid. Bid takes a price, an idea of the escrow you want, who, are, who is the seller, who is the buyer, uh, how much escrow does the seller put in? How much escrow should the buyer put in? And then some text maybe just to describe what we're doing. And the only one who's allowed to do this is the buyer. So we check, is this signed by the buyer? Who, who claims to be the buyer? Yeah. Okay, how much amount should he put in? Well, it's the price of the bicycle plus the extra skin in the game escrow money he puts in. Then we update the bank accounts. So find me the bank account for the buyer and for that balance, make sure the balance is bigger than it needs to pay because otherwise this contract will not work. And the thing with REL is if this fails, like if it cannot find a bank account that fits this criteria, then the transaction fails automatically. This alpha here means, okay, now we're getting to programming. I want one and exactly one bank account back. So if the, if the buyer is trying to make a contract that he doesn't have the money for, then not going to happen. And then we create an escrow. So what's the price? We fill out that escrow object we did before. And this is all this text down here. And the seller, he sees this escrow. And he says, ah, I want to accept that one. So 
all we need to know about him is like, okay, which, um, which escrow are you talking about? Which is the one you would like to participate in? Well, there's this one. Okay, who are you? Well, I, I'm this person. Okay, have you signed this? Are you actually, have you signed with your private key that you have done this? Yeah, I have. Let's find the escrow. Okay, make sure the escrow is, act, escrow is active, right? Make sure he hasn't put in money yet. Okay, update the escrow by putting in his money in there and withdraw the money from his account. Now, you might say, well, you can't update before you withdraw the money. What are you doing? The thing is, this is executed atomically. Either all of it succeeds or all of it fails. So it doesn't matter. There is no other, trans are no other transactions happening on the blockchain at the same time as this. It's serialized. So this is the only transaction that's happening at this point in time. So there we remove from his bank balance the escrow. Okay, let's say that everything went well. Release the, release the escrow. So what escrow would you like to release? Oh, it's the one about the bicycle I wanted to buy. So who is the buyer? That's me. Okay, have you signed it? Are you really the buyer? Yeah, this is my public key. Okay, let's find it. Let's find uh, your escrow that has this ID and where you are the buyer. And if we don't find one, it fails. Okay, require that the escrow we got has a typo there. So, we have the escrow, the status of the escrow should be active, right? Update the seller's bank account and uh, give, uh, sorry, update the seller's bank account and give him back his escrow. Update the buyer's bank account and give him back his escrow and uh, mark the escrow as resolved. Now for the fun part. Burn. So, I never got a bicycle from Tobias. I'm very disappointed. So, uh, I want to burn. Okay, what do you want to burn? I want to burn this escrow. Okay. So, who are you? Well, I'm this guy. Okay, have you signed it? Yeah, I have. Okay, let's find the escrow. Okay, require it's an active. We can't burn something that's already burned. We can't burn something that's already resolved, right? Require, require that you have actually put your money into it. We don't want it to burn something he hasn't put the money into, right? It's going to hurt on both sides. Update this escrow, exactly one, and say that it's burned. And now, there is no way to reach that contract anymore because we have no code that's going to access something that is burned. We could also, of course, here, we could take the escrow object and explicitly set the escrows to zero, 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 zero out everything. But the fact that it says it's burned, it's enough. But, yeah. So what happens to the money that each party has put into escrow? It's destroyed. It's deflation. It's kind of sad. <laughs> yes, it is sad. It's called, uh, the general principle is called proof of burn. Mm -hmm. And you can also use it, uh, let's say that I want to do a business with you or you. And you're both new on the blockchain. I have no idea who you guys are. But I know your public keys. I know your identity. And I found out that you have burned 100,000 crowns from your account. You just destroyed it. And the reason you've done that is to show that you will stay by your public key. You will not change it. This is the same principle for why a bank always looks posh. 
with a lot of granite and stuff to show that you will be around for a long time. But by burning money, which is theoretically more beautiful, but kind of psychologically difficult to deal with, uh, I will trust you more. Because otherwise, I will say bad things about your public key. And then he will have to shift to another public key and burn more money. So, uh, Anna, is, are you the project lead from uh, Legal Work side for the shared register project we're doing together? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, and we're working with this kind of code. We haven't implemented this though yet, or ever maybe in that particular project. So, that's in the entirety. Then, the other uh, things I have down here are just small things like how much money do I have on my account? What escrows am I the seller in? What escrows am I the buyer in? And this is for just deleting escrows that never went anywhere. So let's say I, I'm as a buyer said, hey, hey Tobias, here's an escrow for you. This is nah, I'm not interested. Then I can just delete it. And deleting it is done. Can be done either by buyer or seller. And uh, are you the signer? Find the escrow. Uh, require that the seller has not put any money into it already, because if he has, then it's a valid contract going on. And then we update the account, the buyer gets back his money, and then we delete it. So I just wanted to show you, in rather few lines, you can create something quite interesting, I think. So, there are some problems with this, if, if you now go home and you start doing these escrows. If there's a communications channel between, like, say, me and Tobias, I'm only using you, Tobias, because you're sitting in the back, so it works very well as a transaction. Um, then we could, he could chat me and say, I can chat, I'll burn, I'll burn your money, I swear, if you don't give me a cake, or I don't know, you, you can start what's called game theory, you can start like negotiating, if you do this, I can do that, and stuff like that. Or uh, the seller can say, well, you paid 10,000, but I, I got you 9,000 crown back, right? Do you still want to burn 3,000 of your own crown, of your own money? So, it might be, if you started using this contract, the price would actually always be slightly lower than the one you agreed on, because of this back and forth negotiation. So, summary. Well, which was the language you saw where we did the smart contract in. And Chromia lets you develop, I believe, faster and safer. Even if you were not programmers, I think you understood more or less the lines I showed you. It was only about 60 lines, maybe even 50 lines, that dealt with the actual contract. So we believe this will, if nothing else, improve the bicycle market. Thank you.